And Father's Day is, um, it's not as cut and dry as we would like it to be sometimes. Um, neither is Mother's Day. You know, any, any day that you honor a father and a mother, um, it's, it's complicated because situation and life is complicated. And there's a scripture that talks about, and I'll tell you why it's complicated. Um, there's a scripture that says that um, sin entered the world through man. And when sin entered the world through man, it complicated how we related to one another. We became um, increasingly more selfish and, and we had more problems that we had to work through. So when you talk about Father's Day, some people don't celebrate it. Uh, it's funny, I was talking, someone said out um, when I first got here in the office, Happy Father's Day, and it was a, a lady, it was actually uh, Angela, uh, who does our kids' ministry, and she does a wonderful job, by the way. But um, she said, Happy Father's Day, and you know how out of habit you just say, Oh, thank you, you too, and I said that to her, and we laughed about it. And she said, um, Well, you know, and I said, Stop. We don't do that. Fathers are fathers, mothers are mothers, and great mothers have raised their children. But the mothers that have raised their children without their father, we pray for grace, and we pray that you continue to be strong. But the fathers, but Father's Day are for the fathers, whether the fathers are there or not. We celebrate uh, what, what God has put, put in place. And today we're going to talk about the perfect father. We all have issues. But today we're going to talk about uh, the perfect father. So as we prepare just to jump into the word, please bow your heads and let's go to the Lord and ask for help. Father, we know where to go when we need help. We come to you. You are our help. We have no other place to turn. When we need you, we come to you and you are fully capable of meeting every single need that we have. So today, as we come before you, we ask that you would bless this time in the Word. Thank you for our worship. Thank you for the prayer and everything that has happened prior to this moment. But God, as we dig into your Word, I pray that you would speak to us and give us a Word that transforms our lives so that you are glorified in all that we say and do today. We love you, and we are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today we're talking about the perfect father, perfect father. So years ago when uh, TVs first came out, who remembers when there were no TVs? Okay. Uh, hey, that's a fair question. So... Years ago when televisions first came out, um, they started with different types of shows and eventually they got into family shows and when they got into family shows somewhere in the uh, 50s, um, there were TV shows like Father Knows Best, um, Leave it to Beaver, um, where, where you highlighted the values of our country in the TV shows. So they were highlighted. So if you look at the screen here where it says the perfect father, you see the white picket fence. You see <clears throat> the house, and it's neatly um, manicured. The lawn looks great. And this was the idea um, that a perfect family would always have this sort of, you know, lifestyle. They would have, you know, the single family home, the, the beautiful yard, the American flag out front, the white picket fence, you have a boy and you have a girl and you have a little dog and that was like life. That was the American dream. So in the 50s when TV shows came out, they portrayed this sort of image of morality. That's, that's what we watched. I didn't grow up watching Leave it to Beaver. Some of you may have. I maybe watched a couple episodes um, but there was Ward Cleaver, who was the, the TV dad at that point, and they portrayed him to be perfect. He, didn't, he, he was flawless in everything that he did. He was flawless. He didn't, it was like he didn't make mistakes. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about? And then June, she was on a whole different level. She was on a whole different level. She was flawless. <clears throat> Leave it to Beaver. He, he did, I'm um, sorry, Beaver and his brother, Wally, I think it was, they, they did a couple things. They, they didn't get in trouble. They got into mischief. Right? That was different back then. You didn't get in trouble back in the 50s. You got into mischief. You did things here and there that you shouldn't have done. But the TV families <clears throat> begin to evolve over time. And then you move into later decades, and you had families like um, the Winslows, Carl Winslow, who was a cop, and Urkel, who was the annoying neighbor. Then you had Bill Cosby, who was the doctor, and Claire, who was the attorney. And then you have, um, what was his name, Tim from uh, Home Improvement. Tim, you know who I'm talking about. Tim Allen, thank you, from Home Improvement who he was a klutz, but he was a good dad. He would fix things around the house. And all of these TV shows represented this father and the evolution of these fathers. And they all presented them in a certain light. Now, in the 50s, it was more perfection. But later on, you started to see their flaws. You had dads like Al Bundy. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you watch Married with Children. But you had dads like Al Bundy, who he was just who he was, all right? He was kind of coarse, and, you know, he always talked about his football days. He had four touchdowns in a single game, and he talked about that in, well into his 40s, and he sold shoes. So you started to get a more realistic view of fathers, and then now some of the shows today... They have all kind of definitions of what a father is. I remember Uncle Phil. Who remembers Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince? Um, you know, he, he was uh, a judge, right? He was a judge, right? Yeah, he was a judge. And they showed some issues with the fathers, but really, they really didn't show a whole lot of issues throughout the history of television with TV, TV fathers or TV families. But even when you leave the Cleavers and you get all the way up to the latest TV dads that are on TV now, they all have one thing in common. Now, before I tell you the thing that they have in common, the average TV show, the average 30-minute show is about 22 minutes, 23 minutes, something like that. We didn't know that until Netflix came out. We thought they were 30 minutes. We didn't really think about the commercials, but now Netflix says 23 minutes, so we kind of got a better idea of it. So the average TV show is about 23 minutes. And within that 23 minutes, something happens which gives this idea of perfection. All of the TV dads from the 50s up until today all have one thing in common. They all know how to solve a problem in 22 minutes or less. All of them. They all know how to solve the worst problem. When Will Smith went to jail for parking tickets, Uncle Phil, he solved that problem in 22 minutes or less. When Theo, no, no, sorry, not Theo. When Vanessa went to Baltimore to have big fun with the wretched, they solved that problem. If y'all don't know what I'm talking about, that's like the, y'all need to repent, because that's like the funniest episode of the Cosby Show ever. She stole, they stole a car and went to Baltimore. They lived in New York, went to Baltimore to go to a party. Car got stolen. And then, yeah, it was, it was something. But they solved that problem in 22 minutes or less. And that's the one thing that they all have in common, this ability to solve problems quickly. They come up in every episode. That's what makes a good story, conflict. If you don't have conflict, you don't have resolution. And if you don't have resolution, you don't have this, like, peace at the end of your storytelling. So all of them have the same thing in common. They all, even though they show some flaws in their character, 
they all have this same thing in common where they were able to resolve an issue within a certain amount of time. But that became problematic for us as consumers. Became problematic for us as consumers because what happens is it begins to portray to us over and over and over and over and over for years and years and years that what we see, we can do. What we see TV families accomplish, we are able to do those things ourselves. And it begins to skew and give us a flawed definition of family and fatherhood and motherhood. It begins to twist it. Because we want to have the conversation with the teenager who was on drugs, on drugs three minutes ago, and we sit in the bedroom, we have a conversation with them, and they're like, I understand, Dad. Thank you so much. You're so wise. And then the problem goes away. And we, we've been consuming that for years. But I want to tell you something. And I'm going to read this. I think this is important. If you have a flawed view of fatherhood, it will affect your performance as a father. So all the fathers here, if you have a flawed view of fatherhood and you've consumed this view of fatherhood, which tells you that you can be perfect or close to perfect and you can solve your problems in 23 minutes, it will affect your ability to be a father. And I'll tell you how. Because you'll be impatient. You won't sit down and have conversations. You won't, you won't understand how you need to pursue your children. You need to have conversations with them over time. And if they're dealing with something and they need space to process it, you meet them where they are. To have that conversation with them where they are. If you have a flawed view of fatherhood, it will affect your performance as a father. But that's only one half of the story. Here's the other half. If you have a flawed view of fatherhood, it will affect your expectations of your father. You have a flawed view of fatherhood, it will affect your expectations. So you'll expect a dad to do this, but they are only equipped to do this. And when they don't meet that expectation, then comes the daddy issues. You have an expectation of someone to do everything that you want them to do, to meet every need that you want them to meet. You want them to show up on time. You want them to, to, to give. You want them to do all of these things. And our expectations may be slightly overstated or, 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 or um, uh, what's the word I want? Too much. You, your expectations are too big. And because your expectations are too big, when you get let down, you hit, you hit the floor hard because you had these expectations. But why do we have these expectations? Because we have seen this idea of what fatherhood should look like from our culture. And if we have this flawed perspective of fatherhood, then we have wrong expectations. And, and truth be told, what happens is we have expectations of an earthly father to fulfill our needs when only a heavenly father can do that. Only a heavenly father can do that. So our views can be misguided and, and we can overestimate people and we, we, we can require them to do something that's unsustainable. You can put an expectation on someone to do something that is completely unsustainable. So what I want to do is I want to focus on the perfect father because none of us are perfect. Can I get an amen? Yeah, none of us, none of us are perfect. As people, yes, this is Father's Day, but as people, as mothers, as fathers, as children, as grandparents, none of us have reached perfection. None of us have the ability to do everything. We need help, and we need a lot of help. So I want to take a few minutes just to look at the perfect father. Because he and what he has done 
has changed, truly changed our lives forever. So let's look at three things that make the perfect father, a father that we can truly trust. And that is our father, God. And the one thing that God gives us is unconditional provision. He gives us unconditional provision. Why is this important? Because we have to settle once and for all that we cannot provide for ourselves. No, I'm not talking about, it it doesn't mean you need to quit your job. That's not what I'm saying. We cannot provide the deepest needs that we have for ourselves. We don't have the ability to do that. We cannot give ourselves, and and I think this is what happens a lot of times when we're dealing with um, anxiety. What we want to do is we want to solve the problem of anxiety and give us peace by eating a gallon of ice cream and binge watching This Is Us. What we're looking for is a way to suppress the anxiety. And if you have another area of your life where it seems like you're depressed or you don't have joy, what you might do is some of us may turn to the bottle. We start drinking and drinking and drinking because what we're trying to do is suppress reality and make the pain go away by choosing a different vice. We're trying to provide for ourselves, and we don't have the ability to provide for ourselves. But what the perfect father gives us is unconditional provision. We don't have to perform for him to provide. We don't have to perform. You don't have to do a list of 10 things, and once you complete this list, then all of a sudden God provides for you. I want to read something to you in Matthew 6, because we get some insight. This is the B, uh, the the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is talking, his first and greatest sermon in Matthew chapter 6. He is giving some instruction to his disciples and those who are following him. And they are concerned about having food and they are concerned about having clothing and they are concerned about what they are going to eat. And Jesus addresses this in this text letting them know that they don't have to worry about the things that they need, but God will provide those things. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 says this. So don't worry about these things. Man, what an opening. What an opening. Don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. And then he gives us the priority in verse 33. He says, okay, he knows all your needs. So what you do first, he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. And live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. He is telling us to seek the kingdom of God above everything else. One of the major problems that we deal with in our lives is we have this habit. When we need something, we seek the thing. We pursue the thing. If we need something, we're like, okay, I got to get it. I got to figure out how to make this happen. I'm going to make this happen. Then you start hitting up people, say, hey, ha- do, do you know someone who can do this? Do you, do you got a guy for this? Do you got a, a, a female for this? Do you know someone who can take care of this need that I have? And we just pursue, pursue, pursue the need. But in the kingdom of God, which is an upside down kingdom, doesn't function like the world. It functions differently. Scripture tells us, above everything else, seek his kingdom. That's hard, right? It, it's hard because it's unnatural. It, that's not the natural thing for you to do, to seek the kingdom of God above everything else. But this is the formula. So there's another story I want to tell you about our unconditional provision from the perfect father. 
in Genesis where the word worship is first mentioned was in a story of uh, Abraham and his son Isaac. And God spoke to Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. So Abraham told the servants and the, and the leaders in, the, in their community, he said, me and our son are going to go up to the mountain and worship, and then we're going to return. And that was the first uh, mention of the word worship in Scripture, which really means worship is not a song, but worship is an act of obedience. Can I get an amen? So worship was the act of obedience from Abraham. They go up to the mountain. They climb up the mountain. And I know at some point Isaac was like, bruh, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham was like, Isaac knew. When you sac sacrifice to worship the Lord, you need an offering. So they go up to this mountain. And Abraham believes that God is going to make a way. He doesn't know what that way is. He doesn't know what that sacrifice is. But he, know that God, he knows that God is faithful. He knows that God is faithful, and he can trust his faithfulness. He can trust his provision. So they get up to the mountain, and Isaac is laid on the altar. And a lot of times we give props to Abraham for being a man of faith. Excuse me, Isaac had to be a person of faith too to say, okay, dad, I'll lay right here <clears throat> while you throw fire and gasoline on me to burn me up to the Lord. Right? That, I mean, he had to have a level of faith to trust his father and know that the relationship that he had with his heavenly father was a legit relationship. Hit pause right there because that's something for all the parents, not just the father's. But here's something to ponder. Here's something to think about. Do your children know that you love the Lord to that level? Can, can they see it through your actions? Can they see the love of the Lord through your text messages? Through the things that you say to them when you talk to them? Through the things that you watch when they walk into the room? Or do they see something different when they walk into the room? You're like... Pause. Get out of here. What are you doing in here? This is not for your eyes. You don't have to write that down if it's not for you. So Abraham goes up. Isaac trusts Abraham. Abraham trusts the father. That's how it is. Isaac lays down. Abraham. He prays to the Lord. Now I'm going to read this verse right here. Because if you know the story, in, Abra in, in Genesis 22, the Lord provided a ram in the bush right before Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. So in Genesis 22, verse 14, it says this. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. And in Hebrew, it's Jehovah Jireh. That's what it is, Jehovah Jireh. We've seen that song, Jireh, you are enough. But that's what he called the place. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And Jehovah Jireh is one of the names of God because it speaks not to something that he does, but it speaks more so to his character. He is a provider. That's who he is. It's the character of God. So, if you need something, you can trust that God will provide it. He gives us unconditional provision. It's the characteristic of a perfect father. Our father is the perfect father. The second thing that the perfect father provides for us is unconditional protection. He watches over us. He watches over us when he tells us to go right, and then we still decide to go left. He's watching over you. When he tells you to stop and you keep going forward, he's watching over you. He gives us unconditional protection. It's unlimited protection. How many of you ever colored outside the lines? Yeah? You did something you, you weren't supposed to do. 
you lived in ways that you weren't supposed to live. We all have stories, and we'll get into that in our next sermon series. We all have a testimony. We all have stories. But there are times where, where God protected us, and we didn't even know that he was protecting us. And we thought we were big and bad walking out in the middle of the street, two lanes over, there's a car flying by. We don't see it. You know why? Because we were too consumed with ourselves, our agenda, what we wanted to accomplish. But still, the hand of God was watching over you, even when you didn't know it. And here's the crazy part. Even when you didn't want it, he was still watching over us. And I think about times in my own life where God protected me from situations, not just from individual things, like I went out too late and I came home and, and you know, I was drunk or something. Not, not just things like that, but when I lived consistently, every step that I took was in an ungodly direction, but I continued to take those steps in that direction. Even when my mind was darkened by sin, he protected me. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. And he did the same thing for you. He provides for us and he protects us. And the Bible tells us clearly that the enemy has one responsibility, and that's to destroy us. But Jesus said, I am come to protect you. <laughs> I have come to give you life and life abundantly. Yeah, we have an enemy in this world, but God provides unconditional protection. You know what that means? It's unconditional. It's not based on how well you have done so that you've earned his protection. No, he protects you because he loves you. We can't protect ourselves. And I think that's important for us to know. We cannot protect ourselves and we try. In particular, if you have been hurt in your past. If you have been hurt by someone in your past, your natural tendency is to protect yourself. Your natural tendency is to build a wall here, build a wall here, because you want to make sure that you are secure. You don't want to talk to certain people. You start cutting people off. And these are all based on your rules. It's not based on scripture. It's based on your rules. I'm cutting this person off. They can't get close to me. They can't get close to me. I don't want them to get close to me. I want to be safe. But we don't even realize through all of these walls that we built up for protection, we put ourselves in a prison put ourselves in a prison, and now people can't get in to help us. They can't get inside to help us because we put up all of these walls to protect ourselves. And you cut yourself off from mercy. You cut yourself off from kindness. You cut yourself off from love. And people want to love you, but they can't get in. They can't get in to love you. We try to protect ourselves, but our good, good Father provides unconditional, unrestricted protection. What does the scripture say? 2 Thessalonians 3, 3 says, but the Lord is what? Faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. He's going to protect you from the evil one. You don't have to protect yourself. You have to put your faith in the one who has already defeated Satan. You got to put your faith in him and he will protect you. Scripture also says in Psalm 138 verse 7, it says, though I am surrounded by troubles, who has ever felt like you have been surrounded by troubles? Like they are everywhere you go, and it feels like it's inescapable. This is what the text means. The writer of Psalms is saying, there are moments in your life where you will literally feel like you are surrounded by troubles. That means when you go this way, you're running into a problem here. When you go this way, it's the kids. You go this way, it's the job. You go that way, it's your past. You go that way, you're afraid of your future. And every, everything around you, Seems like it's not working in your favor. You have trouble all around you, but what the scripture says, 
you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. Man, come on. That's good news. He will protect us from the anger of our enemies. You reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. It saves me. And the third thing that our Father provides for us, the perfect Father, is unconditional love. This is the one right here. This is the glue that holds it all together. He provides unconditional love. Why is this important? Because we all need love. We all need love. You may act like you don't. You may act like it doesn't bother you if people don't reach out to you or people don't call you the way that you want them to call you. People don't respond to you the way that you think they should respond to you. You reach out to people on their birthday. They don't reach out to you on your birthday. It can affect you, right? And, and, and we can feel like, you know, they don't care. That's because we were designed to love one another. So God provides the one thing in, in, in abundance that we need the most, which is love. He provides that for us. And I know some of you feel like you're independent. No matter how independent you are, you still need true love. And you need the love of the Father. And he provides that. So scripture says, and this is a very familiar passage. So I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation in John 3, 16. And um, you guys know this from a, a, a series that we did a while ago, Legendary, where this passage is in a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. And he is having a conversation with a Pharisee. And really, what the Pharisee is asking him is, how can I get into the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, you got to be born again. And then he started telling him the benefits of being born again. He started telling him about this new kingdom that he was asking about. And then we get to John 3.16 where he is talking to Nicodemus and he says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So what do we see here? Well, we see a perfect God giving the perfect gift to us with a perfect love. Love is sacrificial. He gives us sacrificial love. Love will cost us something. And God demonstrated the perfect love in this verse. And he said this is how much he loved the world. He gave his only son so that we would have everlasting life, eternal life, and not perish. Now, Romans 5, let's read that. Romans 5 and 8 says this. It's like unpacking a box. It says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Think about that. While you were still a sinner, while I was still a sinner, while we were collectively still sinners, Christ demonstrated an unconditional love for us by dying while we were in the middle of our sin. It's such a powerful thought. It's such a powerful statement to know that we didn't earn it. Imagine if you did have to earn it. What would you do? Like, what would you do to earn it? What, what, what could I possibly do to earn the love of God? I have nothing to give. I don't. I don't have anything to give other than my life. And that's the only thing that he's asking for in return. So when Scripture says that he loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, you wouldn't perish, but you would have eternal life. And then Romans 5, 8 says, he showed his great love for us in that while we were still actively pursuing another love, he was pursuing us. We're chasing after some other idol. 
We're moving towards this other thing saying, I want you. I need you. I want, I want you in my life. I want you. And God is saying, no, but I want you. And while we're pursuing something else, and it, that something else could be anything. It could be ambition. It could be power. It could be your need to be the best at whatever it is that you're trying to be the best at. And in pursuit of that thing, you completely forget about the God who loves you so much that he is not only, he's not just watching you from a distance pursue another God, but he's walking alongside of you, protecting you so that you don't get hurt. He's keeping you safe. He's providing for you, even in the process. That's what love looked like while we were pursuing Sin, he was loving us. Some crazy stuff. Imagine that for your own life. You pursuing the love of your life while the love of your life is pursuing another love. But it doesn't stop you from pursuing. And it didn't stop God. Even while we were going after The sin of our past. He was coming after us. He was coming after us. That's a demonstration of pure love from a perfect God. Amen. So C.S. Lewis said this. The Christian does not think God will love because we are good but that God will make us good because he loves us. He makes us good because he loves us. He doesn't love us because we we do things right, because we're perfect. No, we're not. We're not even close. But it's because he loves us that he makes us good. He gives us, Scripture says, his righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Everything that we have is in Christ Jesus. So he pursues us because of his love. And this is the thing that I want you to know. He loves us too much to leave us where we are. So let's say you're struggling with something right now and, 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 and you really want to stop. You really want to find freedom. God is pursuing you right where you are because he loves you too much to leave you there. And we see that in Romans 5 eight, while we were sinners. He demonstrated his unconditional love for us while we're still sinners. That verse gets me every single time because I, I tend to, and maybe it's just me, I don't think it is, but maybe it is, I tend to humanize examples in my mind of what it looks like to love. And I know as humans, when we love something, when we love someone, we got like a, like almost like a faucet Like, we can turn it on, and we can turn it off. We can turn it off quickly. Do something to offend me. I'm turning my water down. Keep doing it, I'm going to keep turning it down. You don't stop doing it, I'm turning it off. (laughs) I have just cut you off from the flow of love from my life. And we can be, is that just me? Okay. Okay. Well, y'all ain't say nothing when I was giving, when I was doing all of this, y'all ain't say nothing. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's us. That's our definition of love. That's why Father's Day is complicated. Because our love is tainted. It's flawed. And I know there are fathers that weren't there. I get it. And those are the ones you got to pray for. Got to pray for them. You do. I don't want to pray for somebody that, that didn't love me 
while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we love because we were loved. That's why. If, if you needed a reason, and I don't know who this is for specifically, but if you needed a reason, that's your reason. Because while we were sinners, while we were actively pursuing our own God, the true God of the Bible was pursuing us. He's the perfect father. He's the per there is no earthly father that has that resume. It doesn't exist. We do our best. Some of us, some of us don't do anything, but you know, we, we, it, it is what it is. But when we cross the line as Christians, as believers, we have a different responsibility. Knowing Christ does not get rid of our problems, okay? I, and I really want you to know that. <clears throat> Some people believe that. Well, I, I'm a Christian now, so I shouldn't have all the problems. No, knowing Christ doesn't get rid of your problems, but it does help you to get through them. He will help you to get through them. The love of a perfect God, the provision, the protection of God will help you to deal with and get through the worst times in your life. So I just want, I wanted to remind you of the love of the Father because his love is perfect in, in this earthly realm. And yeah, I get, I get that it's Father's Day, but we can look at people and say, they didn't meet my expectations. They're no good. They didn't meet my expectations. They're no good. He met my ex expectations, so he's good, but he didn't, so he's no good. And we can do that back and forth, back and forth all day, but at some point in our lives, there should be a time for healing, a time for growth, a time for you to mature in your walk with the Lord and understand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is a perfect Father, and I want to spend the rest of my life worshiping him, loving him, because while I was in sin, he gave it all up in pursuit of me. Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. I believe that you spoke to us today, and I pray that someone was encouraged, encouraged to hear of your great love, your unconditional provision and protection for your children. Father, we are grateful and we just want to say thank you for being the perfect father. Thank you for loving us with no strings attached. And we're grateful, Lord, for speaking to us today. Father, I pray that all those under the sound of my voice that they have heard from you. And I pray that their hearts have been changed and transformed through the hearing of your word. Father, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let everybody say amen. Can you all please stand? Let's stand to our feet. And momentarily, we're going to sing uh, one more song. Before we sing that song, I just want to give an opportunity for someone who doesn't know the Lord. There may be someone here uh, who doesn't have a relationship with the Lord. You hear me talking about the perfect father and what God does and, you know, all of these things. But you may not know who he is. He may not be your personal savior. You may not have accepted Jesus into your heart. Or you may be watching us online and it's the same thing. You hear us talking about Jesus, but you don't know who he is. We believe in Jesus. We believe he's the son of God. We believe that he died for our sins and he rose again. And I will not let a Sunday go by without saying he is Lord. Jesus is Lord, period. He is Lord, and we have to accept him in our heart so that we can have eternal life. And if you haven't done so, I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. So 
If you don't know the Lord and you want to give your heart to him, just raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, we're going to pray with you. Amen. I see your hands. And if you're watching online, I'm going to have you repeat this prayer. I'm going to have you guys repeat this prayer too in person. Actually, everybody, let's just say it out loud. Let's just say it out loud. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I give my heart to you. I want to live my life for you. I have sinned, and I'm asking you to forgive me and to come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I believe that you were raised from the dead for my justification and for my salvation. Thank you for giving me life. I want you to be the Lord of my heart, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.